All right, so thanks everyone again for joining us for the Hudson River Maritime Museum's Follow the River Lecture Series sponsored by Rhonda Savings Bank. Uh, tonight's speaker with us is Jonathan Daniel Wells. He is the professor of history in the Residential College, the Department of Afro Afro-American and African Studies, and the Department of History at the University of Michigan. He is the author and or editor of a number of books, uh, the most recent of which is The Kidnapping Club, Wall Street Slavery and the Resist and Resistance on the Eve of the Civil War, which was just published in 2020. Um, his talk tonight is the New York Kidnapping Club, um, which will be a discussion of the types of slavery and slave trading that were happening in New York in the lead up to the Civil War. Um, so again, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat as we go. I'm going to turn it over to John and John, if you want to share your screen, we can go ahead and get started with your talk. Thanks uh, again, Sarah, for inviting me. Thanks everybody for making time uh, out of the middle of your week to uh, listen to uh, uh, about my book. And uh, what I'm going to do uh, for the first half hour is talk about uh, the book and what the kidnapping club was all about. But also I do wanna leave time for Q and A. So we will uh, certainly leave a half an hour or so if we can for that. Uh, the talk that I'm gonna uh, do today is uh, called the New York Kidnapping Club. And that also uh, actually is the title of the book itself. And surprisingly, uh, not many people have heard of this group and I had not really heard of it until I started doing research for another project, which, um, you know, I kept seeing allusions to this thing called the New York Kidnapping Club or the Kidnapping Club of New York. And uh, a few years ago, when I first started to come across references to this group, I really wanted to learn more about it. And that's what led to the book that was published uh, last fall. So what I want to do uh, for the next uh, several minutes is, first of all, talk about some of the context, some of the background. And, and please forgive me if this is, you know, sort of old news or if, if you've heard this uh, or know a lot about this, but I just wanna make sure we're on the same page in terms of understanding the background. And, and I'm gonna do that in two ways. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the constitution and the fugitive slave law that is absolutely vital to the kidnapping club. And so after we've talked a little bit about the constitution and the fugitive slave law, uh, I then wanna talk about the context of pre-Civil War New York City and Brooklyn too. Uh, and talk about why it was that New York was a place where this group uh, of nefarious actors could in fact uh, pretty much operate with impunity. Then uh, we'll dive right into understanding the kidnapping club itself. What, who was it made up of? Uh, who, who were the, the members of the New York kidnapping club? What were they doing? And then who was fighting against them? And I think that, that story of resilience and, and black activism is also crucially important. And then finally, at the end, uh, what I wanna do is talk about the ways in which the, the kidnapping club begins to decline by the 1840s. And uh, unfortunately, I can't end on a good note because that at the same time is the, the period in which the transatlantic slave trade makes New York City one of the key ports in the transatlantic slave trade that had been illegal for 50 years. So uh, that's how uh, I wanna set up the next half hour or so. And um, I can see some of you, but not all of you. So uh, I can see Sarah. So if, if something comes up and, and you need further clarification or if something's not clear, uh, maybe Sarah can give me um, you know, a wave or, or something like that. So the context for this group uh, that I call the Kidnapping Club, uh, first of all, you know, we got to think back to the founding of, of the country, the revolution and the constitutional convention at the end of the 1700s, because there we're going to find the kernel of the New York Kidnapping Club. And it really develops in part because the Constitution and, and the compromises that are drafted at Philadelphia in 1787 uh, really try very hard to take account of the fact that we have a nation already deeply divided over slavery, even as uh, the so-called founding fathers are sitting down in the sweltering summer of 1787 to draft the constitution. 
And we know that there's a lot of compromises, right, that they have to hammer out. The compromises between big states and small states and states with small populations and states with large populations. But one of the key ways that are gonna interest us tonight is the fact that um, they have to accommodate the, the, the truism that there are uh, free states that wanna come into the union uh, in the North and that there are slave states in the South that want to remain committed to slavery even as they enter this new union. Not every Northern uh, colony and, and then state had done away with slavery by 1787. They had begun thinking about it, um, but really only Massachusetts and, and Pennsylvania had, had really gone the extra step to make it happen. New York state doesn't really abolish slavery, as many of you know, uh, until 1827. So they're pretty late in the game. Um, but even so, you know, it's pretty clear that by the time the constitution is drafted, uh, that the Northern states seem to be heading in the direction of abolishing slavery. Uh, and the Southern states are clearly committed to slavery in a sustained way. And so how do you take account of the fact that there might be some African-Americans, some people who are enslaved in Virginia or Georgia uh, or the Carolinas who against all odds and at tremendous personal risk are gonna search for freedom. They're gonna try to leave uh, the plantation, leave uh, their enslavement and uh, try to make better lives for themselves. And they hope eventually uh, better lives uh, for their families under freedom. It's really this uh, African-American desire for liberty the fact that black people in slavery were not by any means content with their condition, despite the lies that are being put out there by the pro-slavery white South, uh, that they're perfectly happy with their condition. The fact is we know there are thousands of black uh, enslaved people who leave their bondage, again, at great personal risk, and uh, make their ways uh, to Boston and Philadelphia, to Detroit, um, to New York City. And we'll never have hard and fast numbers, right? I mean, by nature, it's a surreptitious activity, isn't it? It's gonna be secretive. So I can't tell you in 1790, 7,452 uh, people escaped slavery in the South and made it to the North. We're never gonna have those kind of hard and fast numbers. But we do know that by the thousands, every year, African-Americans are giving lie to the pro-slavery argument that they're content with their condition in slavery. Why is that important? Well, it's because in the constitution, that has to be accounted for. And in our nation's document, our founding document, the one that's supposed to guarantee life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there is a nefarious, infamous clause called the Fugitive Slave Clause. And it literally required in black and white print in the nation's founding document, Northern communities to return runaways to uh, those who claimed to be their masters. Now, the thing about the Fugitive Slave Clause, as clear as it can be, that uh, if you make it to freedom in Boston or New York or Philadelphia, that doesn't mean you're automatically free. You're supposed to be returned. Um, as clear as that appears to be, there's actually a lot of ambiguity there because there's no mechanism for making that happen, right? Who's going to be responsible for capturing runaways and returning them? Is it white Southerners themselves? Are they going to have to leave Georgia and, um, you know, take a ship or eventually take a railroad up to New York to try to recapture their slaves? In some cases, that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, in some cases, it'll be the police who are charged with this. Um, but there's so much ambiguity here uh, that it, it really makes for some problematic politics uh, for the generations that come after the founders. You know, I, I think we're, we're getting pretty used to knocking the founders down a few pegs, right? It's not like it was 50 or 100 years ago when 
you know, we paid homage to George Washington as a sort of infallible general, or we worshiped Thomas Jefferson as this, you know, genius, uh, unqualified genius philosopher. You know, we become a lot smarter, I guess, <clears throat> and less, um, less willing to create them uh, as gods. Uh, but it is true that they set up a system that not only protected and defended American slavery, uh, but in fact, really punted on this issue of fugitive slaves. They essentially left it for future generations of politicians to try to take account of the fact that so many black people wanted to leave slavery and gain freedom in the North. And every generation after the founders struggled mightily and ultimately failed to take account of that division. And that's, in my view, why ultimately we have the Civil War. And we can talk more about that in the Q&A, if you'd like. So the Constitution has a number of compromises. The Fugitive Slave Clause is one uh, that's a compromise to try to appease the white South uh, and try to make it harder for Black people to run away and attain their freedom. And yet they did so, again, by the, by the tens of thousands. So why does New York play a, 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 an unusual role in all of this? And by New York in this case, I really mean the city, but we're also gonna talk about New York State because you know, I, I think in our modern politics, we've gotten used to thinking about the rural and the urban divisions within the country politically, haven't we? Right, I mean, the divisions pol politically speaking aren't really North-South or east west they're urban and rural so when i go outside of of detroit where i live which is predominantly black and i drive a few hours um, you know into rural michigan i'm as likely to see confederate flags uh, outside of people's garages than i am when i take a drive in north carolina which is my home state and if you, uh, and that's because whether you're talking about Michigan or New York State or North Carolina or Alabama, the rural areas of the country tend to be politically conservative. Whereas if you're talking about cities in the South, right, Charlotte, New Orleans, Atlanta, they all vote um, progressive, uh, politically speaking. In this period of American history, the part that we're talking about tonight, the exact opposite is true. New York City is extremely conservative politically and racially before the Civil War, and by the way, for a long time after the Civil War. The New York City and the Brooklyn that we know today as multicultural and tolerant and pluralistic and even you know, politically progressive, none of that was true for the 19th century. And in fact, in the book, I argue and it's not something I say lightly, but I think it's true, that New York City is the most pro-slavery, pro-South city north of the Mason-Dixon line before the Civil War. So why is that? Well, first of all, it has a lot to do with the growing prosperity of the city. And in, in this case, I'm also talking about Brooklyn. We know that in the early 1800s, right, in the first half of the 19th century, New York City is becoming one of the world's great uh, capitalist global centers of financial capital that rivals London. And hundreds of thousands of people are now making the city home. Only a small number, number of them are, are black. Only about 16 to 20,000 New Yorkers are African-Americans before the Civil War. And we're talking, you know, in a city that numbers 350, 400,000. Um, but a lot of that prosperity that we know develops in this part of the 19th century, it makes New York what will be New York, is based on the cotton trade with the American South. So all of that cotton that's being harvested by enslaved people in Alabama, Louisiana, the rest of the, of the South, it's being grown and harvested by enslaved labor. It's being bailed up into cotton bales 
taken to markets in Richmond or New Orleans or you know, Charleston or Norfolk. And then ultimately all that cotton is going where? It's either gonna go to New England, to the textile factories like Lowell, Massachusetts, or it's gonna go overseas to the UK. One, this this uh, may be old news to you, but it, it was new to me. I went to Liverpool uh, for the first time about 10 years ago. And, you know, I knew the Beatles were from there. So, and I knew, you know, it was on the water. I knew some things about it. But then there was a slavery museum in Liverpool, England. And I'm thinking, what the heck is that about? Well, it's because Liverpool and Manchester had uh, a great many textile factories. And so they were just as dependent on the cotton trade that was grown by black and slave labor in the South as were textile mills in the North. And all of the movement of these cotton, these cotton bales, you know, that they're gonna be uh, moved from raw materials to finished products in the UK or in New England. All of that is facilitated by New York financiers on Wall Street. So the banking industry in New York City, the shipbuilding enterprises in New York Harbor, merchants, insurance companies are making tons of money off of insuring not just the cotton bales that are being shipped, but they're actually carrying out property insurance policies on enslaved people. And this is all uh, sort of contributing to the growth of New York City, population-wise, wealth-wise, and it, it is helping to make New York a very conservative place when it comes to race. Because New Yorkers, particularly those on Wall Street, know exactly where a lot of their money is coming from. And it is heavily dependent upon slave-grown cotton and the cotton trade with the South. It also happens uh, that New York City is dominated by the Democratic Party in this period. Um, and we know it today as a uh, as Democratic uh, place, like every city in the country is pretty much. Uh, but of course, in this period of American history, the parties were 180 degrees different when it came to race than they are today. If Donald Trump had been alive in the 1850s, he would have been a Democrat. And the Democrats are the ones that are really dumbfounded that anybody would care about the plight of black people or the fugitive slave crisis or anything else when it came to black civil rights. What were they concerned with? Keeping the union together. That means keeping the South happy and keeping the prosperity of the cotton trade flowing. So the fact that New York City is very democratic in terms of politics, the fact that it's very um, enmeshed in the cotton trade makes it a very dangerous place for black people uh, in the 19th century. And particularly in this period we call uh, the antebellum period before the Civil War. John, I'm just gonna stop you for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. We just have some uh, questions about the slides. I wanted to remind you. Oh yeah, I gotta move along. about advancing the slide, so. Yeah, you don't like you don't like the book title, the book cover, huh? Well, there's one that I should have showed. Thank you. I wondered if you had forgotten, so I thought I didn't. I remember. pretty much did, yeah. Even though it's staring me right in the face. Sorry about that. That's okay. So, um, you know, we covered most all of these points actually, but it, 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 this is an illustration that shows you, you know, how democratic, how strongly uh, democratic the city was before the Civil War. There are Republicans, um, but they, well, the first Whigs in the you know, 1830s, 40s, and then there are Republicans beginning in the 1850s. And the Whigs and the Republicans, um, for lack of a better word, you know, they're the sort of more liberal uh, parties when it comes to race. Abraham Lincoln, for example, not that he's any great radical when it comes to racial equality before the Civil War, but he was a Whig and then he joined the Republican Party, of course. So yeah, thanks, Sarah, for the, for the heads up. Okay, so now we're on track again. Um, and no doubt I'll need another reminder, but what I wanted to say uh, was now that we understand the context, uh, 
what was this group called the, the Kidnapping Club that sort of came into existence with the constitutional uh, compromises over slavery, with New York City being so pro-South and dependent on the cotton trade and so unconcerned uh, with the plight of African-Americans? Well, it goes back to the point I made earlier about the fact that the Constitution's fugitive slave clause doesn't really put any mechanism in place to capture runaways. So there's kind of this haphazard system that develops. And one of the ways it's really key uh, that it's happening in New York City is with the help uh, of the New York City police force, the NYPD. They are actively involved in patrolling the streets the alleyways of Lower Manhattan, walking along the docks and the wharves that line the Hudson River and the Battery and the East River in search of anybody who they could even remotely label a runaway slave. It didn't matter whether you were born free or not, or whether in fact you were a runaway. There was almost nothing that was required in terms of proof. If you know the, uh, the story of 12 Years a Slave, the story of Solomon Northup, which I'm sure all of you do, um, he had free papers indicating his free status, but these are just paper documents, right? They can be lost or stolen or damaged. So, you know, they're really flimsy, precarious ways to protect people's basic liberties. And that's if the police cared at all, which oftentimes they did not. So the Kidnapping Club was a group of New York police officers, guys like Tobias Boudinot, his buddy Daniel Nash, uh, some judges like Richard Riker and Samuel Betts. Betts sat on the uh, Southern District of New York and the federal bench and Richard Riker was a, was a city judge. He sat in the uh, city recorder's office. And then along with some professional slave catchers, and, and there are literally people who make a living off of cat, capturing runaways and then getting the reward money. One of them is a guy named Fontaine H. Pettis. How's that for a good 19th century name? Fontaine H. Pettis is a lawyer who's from Virginia, but he sets up his legal office in New York City. And what he wants to do is uh, place ads in Southern newspapers. And he says, look, I'm here in New York City. We all know there are plenty of runaways, uh, you know, milling about the city. If you just send me $20 uh, and a description of the person who ran away, uh, I'll be on the lookout for him or her. And I'll let you know when I track them down. So this group, you know, they're, they're not really an organized group, but together they conspire in their own ways to make life a living hell for black people, men, women, and children in New York City before the Civil War and in Brooklyn uh, before the Civil War. How do they get this name? Well, it's really interesting and I'm glad you asked. Uh, it was David Ruggles. Uh, I don't know if that name means uh, much to you guys, but it didn't mean anything to me um, until really recently. And here's a black activist who deserves to be much better known than he is. He is essentially the Frederick Douglass of pre-Civil War New York City. He is um, born free in Connecticut, but he moves to New York City and he uh, lives on Les Bernard Street in Lower Manhattan. So if you go to Les Bernard Street, you know, right there in Lower Manhattan, you, you see a plaque on the wall that says, you know, this is where David Ruggles lived, but you could easily blink and miss it. And he is just this amazing activist who is also roaming the alleyways of Lower Manhattan, taking the ferry across the East River over into Brooklyn patrolling the coastline of Lower Manhattan and the Battery to try to gain any intelligence about these activities engaged by Tobias Boudinot and Daniel Nash and Richard Riker and Fontaine Pettis. And he's a journalist by trade and he actually publishes a newspaper. 
And you can see this if you go, if you just Google it, uh, it's called the Mirror of Liberty. And I don't know, did I include? No, maybe, maybe uh, next time I should put up an example of it up so, people, so folks can see it. But the Mirror of Liberty is a detailed record that David Ruggles publishes himself. It's a newspaper. And in it, he names publicly all of these guys, Betts, Boudinot, Pettis, Riker, and many, many others. And he's the one that slaps this label on them, the New York Kidnapping Club. So I can't claim you know, that I came up with it. I actually got it from David Ruggles, who's the one you know, who came up with it. And I also you know, need to give him every credit in the world because if it wasn't for the fact that he recorded in minute detail, all of his interactions with uh, the actors here of the New York Kidnapping Club, um, then history might never know what exactly was going on. And what was happening was that New York City was being terrorized. The black population of the city was being terrorized by the New York Kidnapping Club. And it was all too easy and efficient. All, so, all Boudinot had to do as a police officer, and he's kind of the arch villain of this whole story, Tobias Boudinot, a member of the NYPD. All he had to do was approach a black person on the street and say, oh, I know you, I recognize you. You're Joseph Smith who ran away from a plantation outside Richmond three years ago. And there's no jury trial, there's no due process. And within an hour, you could be taken before the city recorder, Richard Riker, who was a prominent Democrat, uh, a member of the Democratic Party elite who really could care less what happened to black people. And within an, a, a few hours, before your family even knew you were gone, you would be arrested, convicted of being a runaway, and you'd be on your way to Southern slavery, whether you were in fact born free or not. It's not just David Ruggles. I mean, but he's really key here because he is everywhere. I mean, he's a guy that really gives up his physical health. He dies at a young age, you know, in his 40s, because he just gives everything he has to fighting against the kidnapping club. He's tireless. But there are other African-American and white activists in New York City uh, who form this resistance. Uh, against the kidnapping club and their activities. They try to you know, publicly shame the, the members of the kidnapping club. They try to bring light to it in newspaper and, and speeches and, and, and things like that. Um, a lot of them are joining this group called the New York Vigilance Committee, which is a, a new committee that's been set up to fight against this kidnapping of, of um, supposed runaways. And they're instrumental in getting jury trials in place by the 1840s. And that's really what's gonna lead to the decline of the kidnapping club. Because you know, if you have a jury trial when somebody's accused of being a runaway, it's much harder right, to, to, to proclaim them to be a runaway. Now you have to present evidence. You can't whisk them away in the middle of the night before their families even know they're missing. So you have to be, you know, presenting evidence in court and you'll get people who say, oh yeah, he's, I know him. He, he did run away from that plantation outside of Richmond three years ago. I knew him as Joseph Branch and now he calls himself Joseph Smith. But then you have members of New York City's black community say, and they testify in court and say, that's nonsense. I knew him 20 years ago. Right. He used to live in the same boarding house as me, and he can't possibly be the person who ran away three years ago. So, you know, there's there's sort of a performative aspect to these trials, and, and a lot of them do become show trials. But at least we slow down this uh, machine that has become the kidnapping club. And that's due in no small part to upstate New Yorkers who are, you know, even though they're from small towns and many rural areas in, in New York State, 
they are religiously evangelical. Many of them have been touched by the abolitionist movement. And by the way, they very much resent being made accomplices in the fugitive slave clause and the later, later fugitive slave laws when it comes to slavery. So there's again, that sort of 180 degree twist on rural and urban politics. But as much as I'd like to say, you know, that this decline of the fugitive slave, I'm sorry, the New York Kidnapping Club is sort of a, a good way to end on a positive note, it really isn't. Because just as the New York Kidnapping Club is grinding to a, a slow halt in the 1840s, due in no small part to the institution of jury trials, at that same time, believe it or not, New York City is becoming one of the most important global participants in the transatlantic slave trade. And this has not at all gotten the, the attention it deserves. There's a new book, by the way, and Sarah, um, not, to, not to tell you your business, but it might be a great thing to have uh, my friend John Harris on. He's the one who's written this new book called The Last Slave Ships. Guess what? We already have him scheduled for May. Awesome. So <laughs> this all, you know, in a perfect world, he'd be coming next week. But, you know, this will be a good segue because his book is all about that. It's all about the 1840s and the 1850s. Now, you know, we know that the fugitive, um, I'm sorry, I keep saying that. It, it comes naturally now, I say it in my sleep. Um, the transatlantic slave trade had been rendered illegal by the Congress in 1808, right? So you can still buy and sell enslaved people within the United States, but no longer are you supposed to be bringing people from Africa. It's illegal. And yet here we are 40, 50 years later, New York City is building ships, it's outfitting ships. It is, um, you know, merchants buy, uh, supplying these ships. Um, and New York City, along with Havana and West Africa forms this nefarious triangle of the transatlantic slave trade. It's just stunning that America's metropolis Right, the city that we associate with global capitalism and pluralistic democracy was in fact um, harboring an illicit and deadly transatlantic slave trade. It kind of culminates in 1862 with the hanging of Nathaniel Gordon. Um, and, and you know, really the, the, the only uh, person who had really been executed officially for slave trading. And this is something that Lincoln himself uh, approves of. Um, but you know, it, it just shows us that even into the 1850s, even into the Civil War, and even after the Civil War, New York City is a very precarious place for African-Americans. And I'll end on probably an equally bleak um, story, which is you know, my next book project. And it's really about, you know, sort of New York in the, the Civil War years and, and the Reconstruction period after the war. And about, in, in some ways, how it's just as uh, deeply complicit in slavery and, and the legacy of, of slavery, racism and segregation, than it, than it had been before the war. And one of the keys to that is this uh, newspaper I've been reading on, uh, on microfilm. And it's a weekly newspaper, so it's distributed all across the country, but it comes out of Wall Street. And it has this title, the New York Weekly Caucasian. And as the title suggests, it is dripping with the most despicable white supremacist rhetoric. In fact, it really coins the term white supremacy in many ways and makes it a popular term in the United States. So again, as much as I'd like to end on a, on a positive note, um, you know, it, it's not the kind of positive story, I think, uh, that we would all, all, all have preferred. But I take solace. I think it's worth remembering that guys like David Ruggles and people who joined the New York Vigilance Committee and everyday, everyday New Yorkers who testified in court against, you know, sort of 
capturing somebody and taking them into Southern slavery. You know, those are really brave and important people who deserve to be much better known, I think, than they are today. They're really heroic, I think. So that's my spiel, and I appreciate your attention and your, your patience. So I'm um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, so I'm gonna let give people a chance to um, drop their questions in the chat, but I have a question for you. Already? you hopefully you can answer. So you've talked a little bit about um, the urban rural divide in New York being kind of flipped in the 19th century. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about cities like Rochester, which had Frederick Douglass and the North Star newspaper and places like Albany, which was kind of a key point on the Underground Railroad and kind of how they contrast a little bit with New York City. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, another one is Buffalo, of course. But Buffalo is, is on the side of New York City uh, in this sort of political equation. It, why? Because of course it has an important port. And so it's very heavily dependent upon the cotton trade. And so Buffalo is a place where you see a lot of racial animosity. And, and we know the draft riots, right? In, a, in uh, July of 1863 in New York City. What sometimes we forget is a few weeks before the draft riots in New York City, which were you know, sort of deadly Irish American attacks on New York City's black population, a similar thing happens in Buffalo. So, um, you know, there is a tremendous amount uh, of variation between these cities, as you suggest, Sarah. Rochester and Albany are really key uh, sort of progressive places, you know, to use a term that they would not have used, but, you know, sort of means something to us. You know, maybe you would think, um, you know, there's a more, there's a stronger abolitionist sentiment there. Um, one of the reasons, of course, Frederick Douglass lives in Rochester is he wants to be able to make a quick escape across the border into Canada if he needs to. Um, but it's certainly true that Albany is the site of a lot of, of the most kind of liberal legislation, including uh, the jury trial laws that are so crucial here to, to putting an end to, you know, the sort of willy nilly kidnapping of black people off the streets. Okay, thanks. Um, Dan has a question while you're drinking. <laughs> uh, he says, what's the earliest documented this is year a, This of... is a commercial for Snapple. <laughs> Whatever your drink of taste is, mine's Diet Snapple. Pete, of course, how Southern of you. Um, okay, so Dan says, what's the earliest documented year of police involvement in what became the Kidnapping Club? Uh, I would say right about in 1832. And there's a whole another complicated part of this. And, and uh, I guess you'll just have to read the book if you wanted to find out more. Um, and um, it's really about what sets off all of this. And, and that is the escape of, of about a dozen or so African-Americans from Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, they steal a whaleboat and they um, remarkably are able, ooh, there's the word boat, sorry. It took, took me a long to say the word boat for you guys. Um, but they take a whaleboat and they literally sail to the, off the co coast of, of New York, they make it to Cape May. And pretty, pretty amazing that they're able to, you know, sort of weave in and out of the islands and the inlets uh, off the coast. Ultimately, they're gonna, most of them make their way to New York City. But the, the, the governor of Virginia writes the governor of New York. And he says, you know, look, this is really embarrassing. We've had 16 enslaved people not only run away, but steal a boat in the process. So I really need your help in tracking them down. So Governor William Marcy, who is also a Democrat, just like Richard Riker, William Marcy says, you know, that's our obligation, right? The constitution says we have to participate in the return of runaways. So that's what I'm gonna do. And he basically sends the NYPD, particularly Tobias Budno, a blanket writ that says, arrest anybody who you can possibly accuse of being a runaway. And Tobias Budno uses this document so often, this blanket writ from the governor, to justify his activities. 
that he actually has to have it recopied at least once. So, you know, that all happens in, in 1822 and then in 18, 1833. So that, that's really, you know, where my story starts. Great, thanks, John. Um, Carla asks, what resources did you use besides the mirror and where did you find them? Yeah, so the mirror of liberty was really important. Um, again, mostly because Ruggles does record, sometimes word for word, pretty much his conversations uh, with, with people. And um, in addition, there were also a lot of newspapers in New York City at this time, right? We know the Penny Press is um, you know, sort of opening up. We know that um, you know, there are a number of prominent New York newspapers that are gonna report on some of this activity. Now, a lot of them don't really care, right? Because this is happening to black people. You know, why would we bother printing it? But there are a couple of newspapers that are sympathetic and, and really kind of, um, you know, demoralized by the city's participation in all of this. And so they also uh, call attention to some of these stories. So they were good resources. Um, there's also, you know, the other side of the conservative side, the equivalent of the Wall Street Journal uh, in this period, there was no Wall Street Journal in this period, but the, the, the equivalent was a newspaper called the Journal of Commerce. And that newspaper does what the Wall Street Journal does today, which is speak for the conservative financiers of Wall Street. And uh, they were all interested in preserving the union, keeping the compromises over slavery intact and continuing the prosperity that the city had been enjoying under the cotton trade. So that was a really important source uh, as well, because it would say, you know, why do we care about Joseph Smith? You know, he was put on trial this week and here's the testimony. Um, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a waste of taxpayer time and money. So you would get that angle too. Then, uh, you know, just to, to sum up, uh, there are also, so the newspaper accounts are really important. There are also court documents which are held uh, in uh, the New York uh, records offices, uh, right there at the foot uh, of the Brooklyn Bridge. Some of them are off site and really hard to get to because you gotta kind of do it you know, many uh, days in advance. But some of them are, are literally right there too. So I spent a lot of time getting my hands dirty on those documents as well. Great, thank you. Um, this is more of a comment than a question, but you might want to contact Neil when you hear it. Um, Neil says, my great grandfather was Sidney Howard Gay, who wrote an abolitionist newspaper in New York City at this time. He and a black man, Louis Napoleon, were part of the vigilantes group who helped escape slaves. Gay hid escapees in his office before sending them further north. He kept a journal of the people who came through, including Harriet Tubman. Yeah, absolutely. And of That's course, the yeah, very cool. So, you know, the great historian Eric Foner, who I respect and admire, as you know, Neil, r has written a book mostly about gay and using gay's resources. My own interpretation is that New York City was not so much a gateway to freedom, as he titled his book, uh, but a gateway to slavery. And, um, you know, that's what I was really interested in. But of course, both are true, right? I mean, New York City did have an a a uh, active abolitionist community. Sidney Howard Gay was crucially important. David Ruggles was in many ways even more important. Um, and, and you'll actually see references to uh, the New York Kidnapping Club in, in Professor Foner's book. Um, but if we just focus on you know, the, these sort of older notions that New York City is this beacon of freedom, you know, and we forget the, the, the complicity of many cities in the North, but I, again, I'm saying New York City is, is in many ways the worst uh, in terms of complicity. Uh, we're, we're losing sight uh, of the bigger picture and, and how it was really that New York City did become sort of the pluralistic, politically progressive city that it is today, because it sure wasn't in this period of American history as far as I'm concerned. All right, I'll give people a chance to ask more questions in the chat, but I'm gonna ask a bit of a selfish question being from the Hudson River Maritime Museum and ask if um, if you could talk a little bit about the role, you talked about Buffalo, which obviously is on the Erie Canal, um, which obviously connects to the Hudson River. So I wondered if you ran across anything in your research 
um, about the role of that transportation corridor in either the kidnapping club um, or in uh, the Underground Railroad? Uh, I really focused on New York City and Brooklyn for this story, uh, but there are definitely circumstances that I had come across, not just, you know, sort of in the Hudson River Valley, but New Jersey. Um, the, that whole corridor between Philadelphia all the way up to Newark and um, coastal New Jersey, all the way up to New York State, I mean, those were conduits for, for the Underground Railroad, but they were also conduits for capturing uh, fugitive slaves. And, uh, you know, some of the most um, painful episodes happen in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where, uh, you know, that city is so deeply divided over whether or not they are obligated to participate in the rendition of Runaways. Because a lot of people say, you know, look, we are in Pennsylvania, a free state. Why are we being made complicit in capturing runaways by the fugitive slave clause in the Constitution? And then even more so by the fugitive slave law that's passed in 1850, possibly, and this is saying a lot, the worst law ever passed by Congress. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's really important that as much as this story that I tell is about New York City, you can sort of tell the same, same story about Philadelphia or about Harrisburg. And these cities are in civil wars themselves long before 1861 when the actual civil war happens because the communities are divided. And, and one of the things that's really interesting to me as I was doing this book, we all know about states' rights in the South, right? It's been a part of Southern ideology, white Southern ideology for, for decades. But it's interesting that before the Civil War, Northern states are developing their own sense of a state's rights ideology because they're saying, what does it mean to be a free state if we're being made complicit in the capture of runaways? If a neighbor that I, or somebody down the street that I know that cleans my house or takes care of my horses or comes to trim my bushes, has been here for 20 years and is now all of a sudden being accused of being a runaway and being carted off to slavery, what the hell does it mean to be a free state? So they're resenting the intrusion of the federal government. And not to get overly political, but it again is a reminiscent of modern politics with ICE, right? With you know cities like Oakland, where the mayor says, you're not gonna come into my city and arrest are our people just because you suspect them of being illegal. Um, and ICE, which is a federal agency says, you know, this is our job as, as the federal government. So you see similar kinds of, of sort of reflections in the, the policy or fusion of slaves before the Civil War. Great, thank you. Um, Carol says, I have an original manumission document dated September 1824, which belonged to my family. It was signed by R. Riker. So she wants to know, what is his background story and was he ever prosecuted? Uh, that is Richard Riker. Um, and uh, I've seen his signature many times, so I know what his chicken scrawl looks like. And, um, you know, it's easy to judge these guys, I guess, because they did participate in the, the ending of freedom for, for Black people, and, and they didn't seem to care oftentimes, like I said, whether in fact these people were runaways or whether they had been born free. But from the perspective of Riker, you know, he is a Jacksonian Democrat. He is a very prominent politician. He actually is involved in the duel in which... Um, uh, Alexander Hamilton is killed by Aaron Burr in 1803. Um, Richard Riker had been a, a second uh, during the duel. He's a very prominent politician. And he gets this position at, as city recorder. And it's really unfortunate for New York City's black population because he cannot fathom why people in, um, you know, the New York Vigilance Committee, for example, especially white people, could, could care about black civil rights, let alone 
jeopardize the very compact on which the nation is based, the Constitution, which clearly says you got to return runaways. And Riker is saying, you know, look, if you don't abide by this, who can blame the white South if they want to secede from the Union? If they want to you know, go and, and form their own government, because we're not keeping up our end of the constitutional bargain. And, and for him, it's just mind boggling that we would jeopardize the grand experiment that is the United States and question its founding document just because black people's freedom are endangered um, periodically. So yeah, not, not exactly one of our heroes in American history. I don't think though, and I talked to Eric Foner about this and he agrees, it's not where the Rikers Island name comes from. That comes from somewhere else, um, but it is spelled the same way. And, and you know, they're, they're sort of both testaments to the longer Dutch history uh, of, of the city. So just to be clear, he was, he was not ever prosecuted or no. punished for his involvement, okay. No, why would he be prosecuted? He's following the law. There's, there's nothing to prosecute him for, right? I mean, he's doing, you know, he's a judge who is involved in adjudicating whether somebody is, is a runaway or an enslaved person. That's his duty. That's what his job is. So, you know, there's, there would be nothing to prosecute him for. And he dies in, um, right in the, in the late 1830s, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So by the time, you know, he's part of this uh, New York kidnapping club in the 1830s, he's already pretty old by then. And uh, he passes away at the end of that decade. Uh, so Carla was asking, who was he a second for in the duel? I honestly don't remember which side he's on, but you can Google it. You know, the, the internet has everything, uh, whether, for better or for worse. So yeah, I don't remember. I think maybe he was for Burr, but that's just... Um, I got a 50-50 chance of getting it wrong. So I, I prefer you Google it and, and find out. I just don't remember, but I know he was there in 1803. Maybe I'll Google it while, while you're answering this next question. You do um, that. That's your job, Sarah. Yeah. Neil asks, um, can you talk about the role of the Quakers in abolition? Sure. Um, they're not very prominent in New York City, right? So they are prominent in places like Philadelphia, um, and in other parts of the country, including, for example, in North Carolina. Um, and they certainly are among the first abolitionists who are white. And they're really, for a long time, the, the only abolitionists. And it's one of the reasons why Pennsylvania does away with slavery in 1780, which is a lot earlier than most of the other Northern states. It's because of, of that very prominent role that Quakers played in, in the city's life and in the state's life. Um, of course, Quakers believed that every being, every human being had an, a light that was given to them by God. And um, that sort of morphs over, uh, over time in the 1700s to a, a belief among some Quakers that slavery is wrong. And then a split happens within the New York uh, Quaker communities uh, in upstate New York, right? Like in and around Rochester, like the Post family. Um, one of my uh, good friends, Nancy Hewitt, has written a book about uh, Amy Post and the Post family in uh, upstate New York, which if you're interested, you, sh you should get a hold of that. So um, the community is split over whether slaveholding is illegal and whether they should be sort of driven out of, 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 the, of the congregation. So Quakers are really important here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they are pretty much invisible in New York City, and um, they don't really play a, a prominent role in, in making the city uh, a better place. Not, not as prominent a role, let's put it that way, as they do in Philadelphia. Um, so thank you everybody so much again for joining us. Thank you, John, for being with us and giving such a great presentation tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting and hopefully we'll see you all next time. All right. Have a good night, everybody.